the chronograph. Of all the watch complications out there on the market, none has grown to become its own category in quite the same way. With purpose-built variations intended from everything from diving, driving, and even those going beyond our atmosphere, the chronograph has carved out an impressive niche in the marketplace, transcending the idea of just simply acting as a stopwatch on your watch to become something more altogether. But how much does the average enthusiast really know about the history, the intended use case of the chronograph, and the wide variety of different chronograph calibers out there in the market? In this video, we're going to be doing a deep dive looking at four things that you should know about your chronograph, very similar to what we've done in the past with diving watches and things of that sort. So the key aspects we're going to be looking at here today are first, a brief history on the world of chronographs, then the types of chronographs and scales, then also looking at different chronograph calibers, and then finally closing out with chronographs in the modern world. Two specific things I wanna call attention to, one is, we did turn back on watch consultation. So on our website, teddyballster.com, if you wanna to talk to a dedicated watch specialist, we actually have people available ready to do that. So if you wanna have a conversation, anything on the site that you're interested in buying, uh, please book a call. Time is filling up quickly. So if you do wanna just have some dedicated time, uh, definitely take advantage of that. I will link to it down below, but it's also in the corner on the website book a consultation. And then in addition to that, we do have a giveaway going on as well. So a $1,600 giveaway. We announced the winner of our previous giveaway and the winner selected a Junghans watch. We're gonna raise up the price just slightly to $1,600 and just keep this going. Really appreciate all the just feedback and just uh, gratitude that you guys had for giveaways. So I wanna keep it going, kind of share the love. And uh, if you guys wanna partake, just follow all the instructions, fill out the form down below, uh, pick three watches from teddybaldasar.com. Uh, those three links, put them in your form. And if you are chosen to uh, win that giveaway, uh, you'll have the opportunity to choose one of those three watches that you selected as your prize. So good luck to all of you that enter. So in order to begin, we should probably first address what a chronograph is and an idea of its origins. So simply put, a chronograph is a mechanical stopwatch that exists within a watch in addition to its regular timekeeping functions. First integrated into a specialized pocket watch designed for astronomers by French horologist Louis Monet, this original chronograph watch dates back to 1816. However, it wasn't truly until the 20th century when the chronograph was adapted to be worn on the wrist and as a result brought forth some notable milestones. So first in 1913, Longines presented one of, if not the first chronographs designed for wear on the wrist, accurate to one fifth of a second. Now shortly thereafter, Breitling released the first pusher operated chronograph in 1915, equipped with a single pusher at the two o'clock position. Patek Philippe drove chronograph evolution further still with a split second chronograph in 1923 before Breitling again changed the game with the first chronograph with two pushers in 1934, a format that is rather ubiquitous in the market today and a design that was adopted quickly by military personnel during World War II. During the 1950s and 60s, this was a period where a number of chronographs that are now considered icons were introduced, including the Breitling Navitimer, the Omega Speedmaster, later being selected by NASA for astronauts and even worn to the moon, you may have heard that before, as well as the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona and the Hoyer Carrera, among others. But where the history of the chronograph reaches its modern day zenith, no pun intended, is with the industry-wide race for the first automatic chronograph that culminated at the end of the 1960s. So this was commonly known as kind of the chronograph just races in 1969. Hoyer interestingly backed by the support of Breitling, Hamilton and Buren and Dubois de Praz, as well as Seiko with their 6139 and Zenith with the El Primero. Though opinions are pretty mixed on who really deserves the title first. In the decades since, while manufacturing and just material technology has just enabled more complicated and refined chronographs, the formula for what was developed during these periods really has remained much of of the same. In modernized versions of these icons we have mentioned are still just pillars in the industry as we're looking at just the present uh, just marketplace and some with pretty minimal changes. The chronograph is also different to other watch complications because the concept has been adapted for dozens of specialized use cases and was built to withstand a wide range of environments. So now let's look at the different types of chronographs as well as the different chronograph scales. Now starting with the most common chronograph scale, one you probably come face to face with is a tachometer. So a tachometer is typically located on a bezel 
or along the outside of a dial and allows for estimating the speed of something like a race car or a plane over a period of time. So let's use the Omega Speedmaster as an example. So say we wanted to measure the speed of a car during a race over a specified distance. So this could be a kilometer or a mile. So as aware, you would simply start the chronograph at the beginning of a measured distance and say it just took 30 seconds to complete that kilometer or mile. The chronograph seconds hand at that point would be stopped pointing right to 120, meaning that the vehicle traveled 120 kilometers per hour or miles per hour. While I'm pretty confident this is not gonna be used in many modern contexts, it is a traditional attractive looking scale commonly seen on many chronographs still today, including the aforementioned Speedmaster, as well as the Daytona and many others. Revisiting that 1913 Longines chronograph again, we have the pulsometer, which is a scale typically used by medical professionals to calculate the heartbeats per minute in a much of the same way a tachometer would be used to track speed. Now, how you would use this is to start your chronograph function and then the counts will either be in a 15 or 30 beats depending on the particular scale. And then the stop chronograph in the seconds hand will be pointing at the calculated beats per minute based on that scale. So this is just basically a way for doctors to shortcut the way that they are tracking a pulse of a patient. Moving into some more obscure chronograph scales, we have the telemeter. So this is used to calculate the distance between a person or an event which can both be seen and heard. So in other words, from a vintage context, this was commonly used on the battlefield to measure the distance of enemy artillery fire. The best modern example of this that is also a bit less depressing than artillery fire is determining how far away the lightning storm is from you with the help of the corresponding thunder. So when you would see the lightning, you would then initiate the chronograph. And then when you hear that thunder that would strike, you would stop the chronograph and determine the distance. And then two more obscure scales. We first have the decimeter, which provides a scale breaking down a minute into one one hundredths and is essential for metric systems and many scientific and engineering pursuits. And to wrap up our conversation on chronograph scales, we also have the regatta timer. So this is another highly specialized, usually color-coded scale, which actually counts down as opposed to up to allow for perfectly timing the beginning of a sailing race. So very specific here. Moving on from chronograph scales, which rely on straightforward measurement of a single time interval, we also can look at some of the complications which exist within the world of chronographs as well, starting with the flyback chronograph. While general chronograph operation involves starting and stopping the chronograph with the top pusher and then resetting or zeroing the chronograph by pressing that bottom pusher, the flyback can be used to track multiple intervals in quick succession as a one touch pusher both resets and then restarts the chronograph right away. And this is really useful for timing instantaneous events like timing a series of laps in a race. Now compared to either a simple chronograph or the flyback, both of which can only time one event at a given time, there is also the retropunt, one of my favorite words out there, or also known as a split seconds in English or a double chronograph, depending on who you're asking and basically what country you're in. The retropunt allows for timing multiple events at the same time that start together but don't necessarily end together thanks to the entirely additional chronograph seconds hand and another pusher. While the simple chronograph is relatively commonplace in the industry, both the flyback and the retropont are more seldom seen as the watchmaking involved in their production is significantly more complicated and difficult and usually only attempted by the most capable watchmakers and established brands. But now that we have a better understanding of the wide range of what chronographs can do, it's time to take up the discussion of some of the difference between the most common chronograph calibers. And this is probably the area where I think a lot of people aren't as familiar with. So I've done a video looking at kind of a breakdown of all the third party movements, but I really wanna just kind of dig in because I think people underestimate really what goes into developing a chronograph movement. So given their higher level of complication compared to time only mechanisms, chronograph calibers tend to be some of the most challenging movements to produce, especially when we're talking about it at scale. However, there are still a wide range of different types of calibers out there to know if you do want to kind of just further your understanding of the chronograph in general. So like simpler watch movements, chronograph calibers can be constructed in either quartz, manual winding, or automatic variants. Though that certainly isn't where the variations will end. For the purpose of this video, we won't spend any time on quartz chronographs as that probably is a different conversation to have. There are a number of different factors that go in just designing and producing mechanical chronograph movements and the nature of the movements themselves makes for tangible differences in the watches and how they operate. 
So starting with the most major dichotomy in the world of chronographs, we need to explore the difference between modular and integrated chronograph systems. So as you may be able to infer, modular chronographs are movements constructed by taking a base movement, either manual or automatic, and often from a major third-party manufacturer like ETA or Salida, and then adding a module on top of it equipped with the chronograph functionality, either produced by the movement maker itself or a specialized modular company like Dubois de Prod being the most famous example of this. So modular systems are used as a way to offer more flexibility when it comes to design and case and they can be pretty cost competitive compared to a full integrated caliber. That said, because modules are added to an existing movement, they can be a little less straightforward to service. And in some instances, watchmakers simply opt to replace the entire module rather than attempting to disassemble it for repair or service. Integrated movements, on the other hand, are, again, whether manual or automatic, developed and produced from scratch with chronograph functionality in mind as a fully integrated concept. The El Primero, the Brightling Navitimer, the Rolex Daytona, and the majority of luxury chronographs from a modern perspective feature movements constructed in this way, as does the venerable Valjoux 7750, perhaps the most ubiquitous mechanical chronograph caliber in the world. Integrated calibers like the 7750 are more straightforward to service than something like a modular ETA 2894. That said, in-house chronograph movements can be some of the most expensive movements to service for the money, no question. So keep this in mind when you are buying and do not overlook having a warranty when it comes to more complicated chronograph movements as we're talking about north of $1,000 in some of these cases for a service. Another important point when considering chronograph calibers is thickness. And whenever I see a new chronograph release, you tend to always see the same type of comments. I wish the thing was thinner. It would be great if this thing was three millimeters smaller. And of course, criticism is fair. I think people in watches are always quick to probably say things that they'd like to see improved, and I think that's fine. But I do think it's important to keep in mind what is actually possible and the limitations that come with automatic chronograph calibers especially. So as an example, the popular Valjoux 7750 comes in with a thickness of 7.9 millimeters. So for context, this is almost double the thickness of the most popular three-hand Swiss movement in the at a 28242 at 4.6 millimeters. So this 7.9 millimeter thickness is just the starting point too. So you have to consider that this will of course need to be fully cased up, also will need to have room for the dial, the hands, which will need to have even more room for just normal passing over the other elements of the dial and also having a crystal on top of this. This is why you will find most watches containing these movements being between 13.5 and 15 millimeters on average in thickness. When it comes to in-house manufacturer calibers from other brands, there are examples where there are just movements that are thinner, but I think expectations and understanding the limitations are important in this world of chronos. I think people are just a little bit too optimistic and hopeful about what really is possible. When you are dealing with manual calibers, because you're removing that oscillating weight, there are more possibilities here, but that is just something I think more people need to consider. A few other nuanced points when it comes to chronograph movements are cam versus column wheel movements, as well as clutches. Starting with the cam versus column wheel. So these are two terms that get thrown around quite loosely in the world of watchmaking, but they are actually quite easy to identify even for a novice when you're able to look at a chronograph movement. And it simply describes how a chronograph is going to start and stop with its function. Starting with a cam actuated chronograph, these are chronographs where the start and the stop is handled with a series of levers and a two-part flat component that is less refined and much more cost-effective to produce than the two. That said, cam systems are still incredibly robust and are used in, again, that Valjoux 7750. But in in terms of stopping and starting, some might be able to detect a more jerky and less snappy response to a chronograph hand, but it is important to note that all cam systems are not made equally, and they still are fantastic chronograph and reliable chronograph movements. On the other end, you will have a column wheel that uses a specialized wheel with teeth that are easy to detect on the back of a chronograph caliber. As the chronograph functions are stopped and started, levers fall in and out of three-dimensional teeth in a way that creates a more tactile and snappy response. So column wheel chronographs are typically associated with being higher end and are more expensive and more complicated to produce and of course service. Issues that lead to makers opting for cam actuated systems. 
In addition to the column wheel versus the cam argument, there's also a distinction between horizontal and vertical clutches, another thing that gets thrown around pretty loosely. After being actuated by the pusher, both column wheel and cam systems transmit the input to a clutch system, which then engages the gear train responsible for the chronograph's timekeeping. To put it simply, a clutch can mesh with the chrono gear train from either a vertical or horizontal angle. Horizontal clutches can be desirable because it puts the chronograph's operation on a full display, assuming that you have an exhibition case back, though it can cause a jumpy chronograph secondhand, requires a few more gears, and sometimes uses more energy from the mainspring compared to a vertical clutch. While on the flip side, the vertical clutch system is less in view, which can be viewed as a downside for some purists out there. It also typically creates less wear over time since the teeth are not meshing together, creating less friction during engagement. So simply put, if you plan on enjoying watching your chronograph engage and disengage, the horizontal chronograph clutch is going to probably be the way to go for you. Whereas if ultimate starting and stopping precision and reduced wear over time are bigger deals for you, the vertical clutch is also a solid option and might be more meaningful in your instance. And we did kind of mention and get into this at the beginning, but I just kind of want to reiterate this again. Chronographs are complicated movements. And if you're expecting the same type of just scenario and use case from a three-hander watch and you want, say, like the thinnest watch out there, you want, of course, the cheapest, say, service cost, then a chronograph is just simply not gonna be for you. But there's also upside that go with them. And I just think it all really comes down to understanding and having the right expectations. And I don't think this is commonly brought up when looking in the direction of maybe getting a mechanical chronograph. So now that we've looked at quite a bit of different concepts around chronographs, what are chronographs from a modern perspective? So chronographs, like the majority of watch complications, arose due to a legitimate need for portable and precise timing. But like many other watch complications and perhaps the entire concept of wearing a watch at all, chronographs are in the present day functionally just kind of obsolete. We all have highly accurate stopwatches built into our smartphones that also do just about everything else we could theoretically think of and need a watch for. And digital timing is also far more advanced and accurate compared to even the finest mechanical chronographs with high beat rates that can track, uh, say, even a fifth of a second or that can track a tenth of a second or even more uh, precise points of time, say a hundredth of a second. So if it isn't the actual need for timing events or say tracking a heart rate, chronographs are clearly fulfilling a different type of need from a modern wrist perspective. Now that isn't to say that a chronograph can't be a handy, ever-present tool for timing a variety of daily activities, but rather that much of the chronograph's appeal in the present day is a play to the impressive and interesting heritage presented by one of the oldest and most popular complications out there on the market. Like turning the bezel of your dive watch, activating a mechanical chronograph allows for a tangible level of engagement with an actual mechanical heart of a watch you can see and feel, which is for many enthusiasts the most captivating aspect of mechanical watches in a modern context. And for what it's worth, astronauts still wear Omega Speedmasters on the space station, for example. So there are a few specific use cases left out there for mechanical chronographs, even in the modern world. But at the end of the day, we don't really like these things for, I would say, logical reasons. It really is romantic. And I think if you're looking at the history of watches, trying to appreciate what is going on with the chronograph watch, I think it's really important to acknowledge what they were able to produce and the usefulness that they presented in years prior. But all right, guys, I'd love to see comments down below if you did appreciate this video and maybe learn something new about your chronograph. Also, if you could only pick one chronograph watch, which one would it be? Please leave a comment down below. Also, if you wanna partake in the giveaway, fill out the form down below. Gonna keep that open for a few more weeks, but definitely do that. Also, if you see anything on teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 25 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, as well as live consultations uh, throughout the week. So if you want to talk about a watch on teddybaldestar.com, definitely take advantage of the consultation feature on our site. We have true watch specialists, people with decades of experience, uh, adding new members of the team. So definitely check that out. I wanna give the best experience possible possible when buying a watch online because I know it is a little bit different and as things have just been locked down, I think it's very important to have this type of feature on a site when buying a watch over e-commerce so you can feel really good about things. In addition, definitely follow along on Instagram as well, taking some amazing photos of watches. It's a great way to actually stay up to date with the content as well. But guys, thank you guys so much for watching. Be well and I'll see you all very soon.